Welcome back to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast, a special episode. Gary and Larry are back again. I'm going to try not to confuse the names just because they have, I think, the same amount of syllables, but I'm not going to count it. Guys, it's a pleasure to have you back on the show. Uh, I invited you to talk about a little bit assassination-related stuff, but I wanted to get your guys' depictions of Oswald. Both of you, Larry, more recent work has been focusing in on Oswald, and Gary, you've done excellent work um, dealing with the other Oswald, uh, focusing a little bit about Robert Webster, but also through our many discussions, we've talked about Oswald. So I wanted to start off with, um, Gary, we'll go with you first. What is your depiction of Lee Harvey Oswald? Well, now it's getting, it's becoming a little more clear now. Uh, Jefferson Morley and has done some good uh, research lately. And it appears to me that Oswald is part of a, a psychological warfare uh, campaign in New Orleans that was run by uh, Joannides. And they were after the Fair Play for Cuba Committee in particular. And his job was to set up that a false uh, a, uh, FPCC office where he was the only member to try to weed out uh, other people who were pro-Castro, supposedly, but more to set himself up uh, as uh, as to link him to the Fair Play for Cuba Committee so that uh they could destroy it now the question is did they know when did they realize that jfk was going to be assassinated it had to be probably by then because they were setting him up sheep dipping him uh to take the fall and that was what mexico city was about as well so it, apparently the whole uh incident with the dre and with carlos bringer was run by Joe Anides. That was that was uh, to get publicity against the Fair Play for Cuba Committee and to single out Oswald as uh, the person who would, in New Orleans was the FPCC guy. And they so they got him on the radio show. They had the street fight, and Oswald wrote to the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. I think to uh, D. T. Lee. Uh, a week be, or two before the, the street fight and told him that he was in a street fight ahead of time. So it was set up. It was it was a plot. It was a plan to, uh, to they were going to do that to get him on the radio or on TV and link him to the communists and to uh, Marxism and to uh, to reveal that he had been to the Soviet Union and had a Soviet wife and the whole spiel. So uh, the the only question is when. And then there's also, too, the possibility that Oswald was infiltrating uh, a lot of uh, groups for the FBI, like Bannister's group. And so he thought he was working for. Uh, well, we're going to get into all this, but let me CIA, just ask FBI. Three, three basic questions for you. Yeah. Do you think he was an agent? Yes. Do you think that he shot Kennedy? No. Do you think he shot Tippett? No. Okay. Well, we're going to cover, we're going to go to New Orleans and we're going to go more in depth in this. But Larry, I want to get your depiction of Oswald. And also, if you can try and get those three questions I just asked in your answer as well, too, it'd be great. Uh, mine will be a very contrarian view. So you ought to love it and Gary ought to love it. Uh, I Gary's description is what I kind of consider the classic view of Oswald. I do not see Oswald. I see Oswald as acting entirely at his own agendas from the beginning, from his from his youth, evolving his own political views, geopolitical views, social views. Don't see him as a. In the end, when we get to 1963, I see him as a tool, but as an unwitting tool of several actors in 1963. But I see him pursuing his own ag agendas. I don't see him as a knowing or witting agent of any intelligence aid at Shizzy. Uh, I see him possibly as a source for the FBI in New Orleans, a voluntary source, uh, talking with them to actually undermine the anti-Castro Cuban exile activities because he was very much pro-Cuba. I think that was very real. So I, I've come to see him in a very different light. And I will say, as a disclaimer, 
uh, in my earlier years, probably in my first 10 or 15 years in and in my books, I write much more of, in regard to the classic view, assuming he was an agent. The research I've done in the last decade or so has totally changed my mind. Okay. I still believe, I think more FBI, just on the basis of the interview with John Fain and the amount of money that he paid back so quickly. Um, we can get into specifics of all this as well, too. But I wanted to have a discussion about this because I think we agree, all agree on certain parts. And then there's a little bit where we might have a different take. And I think it's really important because it is the message of Oswald or who he was is very clouded. A lot of people have different depictions of who he was, and it kind of messes up a little bit of the record. But I like to understand and get closer to where we can find agreements and kind of decipher of who Oswald really was. And I think the starting point and we'll kind of work our way back is when Oswald is being in the Dallas headquarters and we've all seen the footage of him claiming I'm Patsy. He's asking for legal representation. What were you guys, and we'll start with you, Gary, able to pull out of that from those, the innocent screaming, the saying, I didn't do this. I didn't shoot JFK. I'm not even being charged with that. But obviously that's a big kind of conspiracy line for a lot of people that's where they kind of step in and go something's not right here he didn't want to kill the president he wasn't doing it for fame so what's going on well i think at that point he realized that he had been set up you know that he was involved somehow in the plot whether he was infiltrating it and trying to stop it or whether he was being used uh to um you know fire a shot and miss to scare the pro he, he could have been told anything and 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 larry's right in that oswald was not uh knowingly this agent doing these things he was told something he was given uh he was given false information in order to get him to do things that he wanted or he may have been under the influence of mk ultra and split personality where one personality knows what's going on and the other one doesn't and he could have been used that way but uh the fact that he and and you're right about the fbi because when he was arrested in new orleans the first thing he did was ask to see an fbi agent so uh why would he do that if he wasn't an informant i mean that makes absolutely no sense let's stay on the the the, the uh innocent screaming in the dallas headquarters and we'll work our way back but Larry, what are your thoughts on him screaming, I'm a patsy, and being kind of paraded around a little bit? Well, part of it comes from the fact that that's, that's only part of what he said. Actually, he said, I'm a patsy. Uh, I've been to Russia. I work in the school book depository. So, again, we often extract, I won't call it cherry pick, but I'm a patsy is not all he said. I believe he said, naturally, if I worked in that building, of course, I was going to be in Exactly. That. So, I mean... Whatever we might think, he had reasons like, okay, he he, he knew he had been and, and claimed to have been, you know, on the radar since he came back from Russia. He'd complained about his mail being opened. He most recently complained about the FBI visiting Marina. And so, you know, he had, had reason to think that people would immediately associate him with bad things. He had even... Early on, he had even uh, expressed to FBI agent Fain in Fort Worth that he would inform about any contacts from subversives or communists. So, you know, he, he knows he's a person of interest. There's no doubt about that, right? So when he's working in the school repository, there's, there's reasons why he would say that, why he would suspect that. Now, I do agree that there were some other things going on around Oswald that, that day that he immediately became suspicious about, you know, things are things are not happening the way I thought they were going to happen. And that played into the role. But I just getting back to your quote, Oswald had every reason to think that he would be set up as a patsy. Like how many people in Dallas, Texas that day had been in Russia, had a Russian wife? Who do you think the police are going to focus on? OK, out of out of everybody in the school book deployment story, raise your hand. Who, who's the most likely target? Do you believe that he first became on the radar when he went to Russia and did this defector? And do you believe that was a real defection or part of the program as a false defector? I believe he actually went on to Russia on his own agenda. He had become, we know actually from his Marine buddies, from records and so forth, that that 
he had been interested, become interested in Russia, in Japan. And he even is on record as saying, you know, the reason I went to Japan is because of uh, Japanese students I talked to, people in Japan that I talked to that expanded my social views. And I became really interested in Russia. Uh, so I think there's a real evolution of how we ended up into Russia that we can follow. Um, it, it's interesting to look at some of his his early statements when he's in Russia. It's kind of like when he shows up in Russia, he's totally off the American press radar. You know, he, he doesn't even go to the American embassy. He just tells his interest person, hey, I want to become a Russian citizen. Help me do that. You know, clearly he's He's not making waves. The the people that actually uh, ultimately a couple of weeks later reveal him is the State Department going to the UPI because they want to put some pressure on it. It's like, what is this guy really doing? If we get us get him in the press, maybe as Oswald said, they got my family to call me and then I had to talk to a reporter. Gary? I don't agree with uh that Oswald went on his own. And the evidence of it is there's a lot. For one thing, he couldn't afford it. He only had $200 in the bank and the trip cost like $1,500. Second of all, he knew to go through Helsinki, which was a route that uh, intelligence used to get people into Russia. And he didn't couldn't have known that. And how did he get there? Did He, he flew on a probably on a uh, military plane because there were no flights coming out of uh, of England to, uh, to Finland or, or to uh, yeah to Finland at that time. So I mean, there's a lot of evidence there. And then again, when he was in uh, in Japan and he was associating with Japanese communists, uh, who was paying the bill for the Queen Bee when he was there, uh, and he had told. Uh, a couple people, including uh, a couple of his uh, Marine buddies, uh, Bucknell, I think it was, that talked to Mark Lane, that he was going to Russia on a mission. He'd come back a hero in a year or two, and, and, you know, and and so forth. I mean, there's just a lot of evidence that he, he didn't do it on his own. And, you know, of course, I mean, there's we're never going to know what happened for sure. You know, and, and Larry's points are very good but i just don't see yeah we're, we're not debating we're just having a conversation about it. i'm trying to sort out like where we can find some common ground on here on and that would be like if we talk about marina oswald when they meet in russia i mean was that actual love or was she looking for u.s citizenship i mean in my belief it seems like she had a couple of people before that seemed to match Oswald's profile of being like this American citizen or something that was coming over to another country. It seemed kind of like a swallow incident. And I know documents have came out about that recently, but I don't know where your guys would have a stance on that. And then also the journal that he wrote. I don't know if he wrote the journal that he allegedly wrote over like a couple of days or a week or something like that, but apparently it was found out it was only over a couple of days. It looked like it was done all at once. Well, I'll, I'll lead this time. I would say... Uh... I, one of the, the recommendations I would give is that anybody seriously interested read Ernst Titovitz's book on Oswald in Russia. He was personally associated with both Marina, friends of Marina, with Oswald, and look at his perspectives uh, on Marina. Uh, certainly, you're right, Robbie. Marina had actually been moved, encouraged to move from Leningrad to Minsk because she had been dating foreigners in in Leningrad uh you know she she did have a history of that uh Titovitz himself suspected that somebody you know that with her history she would have been very you know positive towards Oswald she would have preferred foreigners that you know that wasn't any surprise that she mapped up to Oswald that she wanted to go to the U.S. that uh, essentially she was very into foreigners and and going to the U.S. So I, I, I think that certainly agree. Titovitz is all over that. And, you know, Marina's background with foreigners. So I think that's very real. One of the things we do have to consider is it's very clear that Marina, uh, that Oswald himself was on the rebound. He had proposed to another Russian girl. He'd actually dated other Russian women. 
and even in his own writings, in his own diary, in his own remarks, it's, he writes that, quite frankly, even after he was had married Marina, it was taking him some time to get over the previous girl because he'd really been in love with her. Uh, so that would be some commentary for myself as far as the as far as the diary. We have some some very good history on. There are two different things. One is what I would call his diary slash daybook, which is his own reminiscence written while he was in Russia. The other is, of course, the manuscript that he started developing almost immediately. Uh, actually, paying a st uh, stenographer once he got back to Fort Worth to write two different two different documents. So it's it's good to keep clear which is which. Yeah, I've read the Titovitz book and I thought it was excellent. Um, and it's clear that Marina was looking to get to the U.S. Uh, because I um, there's a lot of evidence that she approached Webster before she even approached Oswald. Uh, she told one of her Russian friends that she met her husband at a trade exhibition in Moscow. And that was not Oswald. That was Webster. And then she had Webster's apartment building in Leningrad address in her notebook. Uh, and she made all several different excuses as to what that was. Uh, and she changed her story a couple of times on that. And it's clear that the Russians were attaching Soviet women to these false defectors and having them bring them back and then divorcing them and becoming sleepers. But however, Marina and the new documents uh, that came out about her being a swallow in uh, in 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 uh, the Soviet Union uh, uh, proved that she was doing this. But I think she was doing it for herself. She was not going to become a sleeper agent. She she just wanted to get to the United States. <laughs> and uh, then she dumped the KGB or whatever. And her uncle probably played a role in this. And she got thrown out of Leningrad for prostitution, like Larry said. And uh, according to Titovitz uh, or Norman Mailer's book, uh, when Norman Mailer got access to Russian documents. It's, that's amazing. I, I don't understand how he did that when no one else could way back uh, a long time ago. But anyway, uh, apparently they would have sent her to cut trees in the forest uh, as punishment, you know, for the prostitution. But her uncle bailed her out and had her come live with him in Minsk. Uh, and that's how she got to Minsk. And that's how she met Oswald, of course. And yes, Oswald was in love with Ella German, and uh, he met Marina on the on the rebound. And Marina was set up at that meeting. Uh, Titovitz makes a good point that uh, that that uh, she was it was it was kind of a trap, a honey trap to catch up to get Oswald. But I think that later they fell in love and they loved each other. They, I mean, they fought all the time, but I really think they loved each other. Uh, and it's evident from both of their their writings, you know, and and later and and so forth. The problem with her is she was, you know, blackmailed, forced under the threat of deportation to com to cooperate with the Warren Commission, or you know, and she did she did whatever she could to stay in the country, which is understandable, but. Uh, I think they were set up to, to, to get together, but I think that the later on they fell in love. I think um, I do believe the deportation thing. I think it might have been just having that presence in the room might have made it a, a vibe or put something out there to make it seem like, yeah, you're going to answer this way or we'll take your kids away from you type deal. Um, but I do think you guys agree on this point, which is they did fight a lot. They did fight all the time, but that's a normal couple. That's not anything that's like an abusive thing. They hit each other back and forth. They both did. It wasn't anything that was out of the extraordinary for a couple their age, which I think is really important because, I mean, whether you agree that Marina's statement kind of convinced the public that Oswald was guilty just on some basic things or Ruth Payne, for instance, statements that convicted Oswald of the eyes of the American public. I think if you really examine that relationship from like an average relationship, couples having disputes and fights, that's what you get from it. You get more of a humanization of who Oswald is and kind of how the relationship was, not just that he was this crazy nut job that beat his wife. And he cared about his kids a lot, 
So obviously he wasn't just a horrible human being, but that's obviously what the Warren Commission and everybody was kind of trying to paint him out to be. Well, I, I would I would certainly agree with that. And I, I go into great length on that and what I'm writing now. Uh, we we often don't look at either one of them. I'm, I'm one of my concerns is we often look at both of them, rather than as in individuals in terms of conspiracy, just like the Warren Commission looked at them in terms of something else. You know, I, these these views have become so standardized, it's hard to break out of the boxes. But uh, I think one of the interesting things is early after the assassination, Marina was interviewed and said something about Oswald had changed. You know, she wasn't he wasn't the same person he had met. He wasn't as romantic as he had been when they met, which he he was even from his own diary. You know, he would talk about the walks they took and and everything. So she, she's complaining that Oswald changed when he got to the U.S., which the press immediately took. And used to make him into, you know, he's become violent, he's become radical, he's going you know, became this little nut. What Marina is complaining about is, unfortunately, what any newlywed may complain about after about two years. You know, this is not the same person I was dating. Uh, no, we don't have sex as often as we did before. You know, it, it's it's different. And so you, you can take even relatively situational remarks like that, which is what the media did. And create a totally different impression with them. In uh, other of her remarks, she talks about how good a father he was, how interested in the kids he was. And for Lord's sake, she separated from him at least a half a dozen different times. And he would come back to her and plead with her to move in. And she would give in and do it. You know, so they're bonded. Uh, whatever you want to call it, they are bonded. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Uh, I agree with everything Larry said, but you got to realize too that on Oswald's behalf, Marina was not easy to live with. <laughs> she, she was, you know, she, if he hit her, she almost deserved it. I mean, well, she was. She I, I was, think another thing, Gary, she had friends. He, she had more friends than she. The, the Russians liked her. She could talk to Russia. They would give her things that Lee couldn't give her. And so she would be like, oh, I got this from so-and-so. And he would just go, you know, have a fit, which is not unusual. That's human behavior. So she had friends and he didn't like it. <laughs> no. Well, he didn't want her communicating with anyone but himself. That's why he didn't want her to speak English. But also she she belittled him all the time, you know, and made fun of him and, and, and degraded him and commented on his sex uh, performance and uh, did things that you know would definitely piss you off if you were if you were Lee Oswald. So I mean, no, I don't ever condone hitting a woman, but I can understand maybe why he did it. He lost his temper, but uh, they had this this combative relationship. But that's sometimes the best marriages. <laughs> are are like that you know i mean they they fight but then they get back together because they love each other you know and it's uh, so i don't know you know but uh, opposites attract right exactly <laughs> well that's one of the shining lights of the warren commission testimony is the george de Mornshield uh testimony about talking about marina belittling oswald and i don't think it really gets mentioned because i mean if we really took this episode and examined what the warren commission depicted oswald as as back then and what we know now it's not nothing close i mean if you just look into oswald's life a little bit you can realize he's not a, a loner he's not this type of person that is just insane mentally unstable that this is why he did it he did it for fame it's it's a completely different depiction now you guys mentioned i'm gonna say his name wrong but titovitz why do you guys respect his work so much and not the other guy that came out that said the other things that he knew oswald when he was in fort worth or dallas or something like that well, one of the reasons is why Oswald himself wrote that Titovitz was his best friend. You know, and, and Oswald had a lengthy correspondence with Titovitz once he would so you can you can prove that they were close even in Oswald's own words and his own writing. So that gives him a you know a lot of credibility. I think he knew Titovitz better than probably any friend he had up to that time, except maybe De Morenschild. But uh it, 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 but there was that a Soviet guy, um, Pavlo. What was his name? The uh, the was also a good friend of his in Russia, and he was spying on Lee. 
Uh, his dad was in, in the Russian army. He was a general or something. Uh, uh, what was his name, Larry? I can't think of it. Start with a P. It is. You're close. <laughs> uh, uh, it, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's somewhere between Pavlov and Pablo. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Those it'll are the right come, it'll, it'll come to me after we hang up. <laughs> Always does. <laughs> But yeah. Genovese has a lot of credibility. I think so does Demore and Shield. It's just the the interesting thing about Genovese is he has a Russian perspective. You know, we don't just get what did Americans think of Lee? What what did the Marines think of Lee? He has a much more objective perspective of, of Lee just as a human being who he knew over some period of time. And and he knew them corresponded with them even after, you know, Lee was back in the States. So he has a longer, longer exposure to what Lee was thinking. And, and, you know, than than most of the people, you know, we, we might get a comment from Oswald's bunk mate at El Toro, you know, okay. How long did you know the guy? Well, I didn't really know him. I just heard him, whatever. Uh, what would you consider probably one of the most crucial points to look at if you were going to examine who Oswald really was? Would you examine Russia? Would you examine his time in Texas? Would you examine his work at the school book depository? Would you examine the DPD when he was arrested? Um, Gary, we could start with you and then we'll go to Larry. Uh, that's a tough one. Uh, Workshop Hill movie theater? I, I think maybe New Orleans uh, when he was in New Orleans. Uh by then he had seemed to have a goals and directions up to until then it was like hit and miss you know what he was what he was going to do with his life uh all those all those excerpts are important and i don't i don't know that i could single one out maybe larry can well yeah it's hard to single one to me it has to be the whole body of work because he evolved over time he, what he was as a teenager was not what he was when he went into the Marines, he was he was one thing when he went into the Marines. He was another thing uh, in Japan. He was another thing back at El Toro. He, he, so one thing I would I to me one of the things that stands out is what Oswald said about himself. Look at his own. He wrote a lot in 1963 about what he believed, and he was he was serious about wanting to become a writer. I mean, he even took typing lessons, and so and. And I, I think you kind of mentioned it earlier, Robbie. If you look at what's in the 26 volumes about Oswald, it is so much different than what's in the report about Oswald that a lot of those things really stand out. It's 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 kind of the common thing is like Sylvia Mayer found it. You know, what's in the volumes is not what's in the report. So that's a good place to uh, look at. Look at the essays that he wrote in 1963, which are in line with what his, you know, when he, look at what other people said, when he went to get job interviews in 1962, 1963, the statements from the personnel people say he dressed nicely, he spoke well, he presented himself well, and he, he tested well. We would have placed him in white collar jobs if we could have, because that's where he was. He was, he, he, tested at a college level. Many people spoke about his speaking skills being quite good, but he always needed money immediately. So the personnel people always had to find him a manual job. Uh, so he's he's in between things. And, and the other thing I would just toss out is it, the cardinal sin that I find out, find with Odd will, over time, is he's, he bores easily. What interested him for six months no longer interests him six months later, uh, whether that's astronomy in high school or photographic work in Dallas. It, he just he has a cycle that he's the same thing applies with Marina. As a matter of fact, he keeps going through this boredom cycle and going on to something different. And that's a very important thing to look at in his behavior. What well, what would you say would be, I guess. The, yeah, I, the worst thing that came up against Oswald, worst thing that was painted against him. I mean, I'm starting to look more at now 
diving into Marguerite Oswald. And it seems like media throughout the years since 1963 has really kind of painted the picture of like, it was the relationship with his mother, this abandonment that caused him to lead up to this event of shooting JFK. And I don't, I don't get the same view take from it that the media has portrayed of that version of this is just an unstable kid who had issues with not having a parent around as a child. Um, I, I do agree there was some obviously childhood issues, but I don't think it was to the point that he wasn't able to be sustainable later. I mean, he eventually he was sending money back to his mother, I think. Um, so and, you know, he came home from the military early to help his mother out because she got hit in the face with like a candy jar or something like that. That just to me, that doesn't strike as somebody that's like I'm mad at the world and a pissed off child that didn't have a, you know, not an OK relationship to the point where you can go back and give up your military ambition just to go back and uh, take care of somebody. Either one, it's up for grabs. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's good. That's a good question. He obviously had a, a, a horrible childhood. He was constantly moving. He moved. He never lived in one place very long. And his mother would dump him in the orphanage and then take him out back out again. And uh, she had two or three husbands and uh and when he was in new york was the worst because he she was working all day and she had to drive a long way to go to work or take bus or whatever she did and he was alone and he was truant and he missed school and he, that was when he was a delinquent really and i find it interesting uh some of the new work dick russell has done they uh when he was uh, caught for truancy he was taken to a youth house and of course everybody knows dr renatus hartog who talked to the warren commission that oswald was an abnormal uh had personality problems and all this stuff but what what russell found out was that hartogs wanted to study him and they took him to bordentown <laughs> to uh, for a week or something to study him and it turns out bordentown was part of the mk ultra program and somehow Renaldus hot dog or heart dogs was tied into that program somehow and so right away they were singling him out they were studying juvenile delinquents and later on uh he may have been you know in their sights as uh for other uh programs or things and it's funny that uh, I'm really been getting into the the, the Dodd thing, the Dodd committee, uh, the juvenile delinquent committee that Dodd had, where they were investigating interstate sale of firearms, and the two companies on the list were Klein Sporting Goods uh, in Chicago and Seaport Traders in Los Angeles, and that Oswald's guns were ordered from those two places, and then he's in. Uh, Adrian Alba's garage, looking through gun magazines for mail order weapons and cutting out coupons. And this behavior was, it can be explained if he thought he was, uh, he was working for this, for Dodd's committee, somehow, somehow through the FBI or through somebody that uh, he was helping them, that they were going to use him as an, uh, to, to, to order these guns. And that later backfired into, you know, the assassination uh, evidence, but it, he he probably thought, well, I'll order these guns, and then they'll you know they'll be a, they'll go to court, and I'll and they'll testify, and he'll you know and he'll be a hero, you know that kind of thing. I mean, so you you wonder if that relates clear back to Bordentown uh, in, in his youth. Uh, it was that was he was first identified. You see, I'm constantly, <laughs> and, and I don't Larry probably doesn't agree with it but every every person every road to me i can trace back to james angleton and i believe that angleton was in control of oswald very early at least 59 when the, he had the only one that had files on him and john newman's new work about the mole hunt is really interesting i talked to john on the phone and this is crazy but he, he, you know, he believes Bruce Soley is the um, was Popov's mole, and he was the one that put Angleton up to this mole hunt using Oswald and Webster, uh, and he believes that Soley was not only a mole, but his assistant, one of his assistants, James McCord, 
was a mole. And it w- and he traced McCord's uh, phone records and everything else. And he, he he now believes that it may have been McCord who was sending Oswald through all these uh, this roadmap to get to Russia, you know, uh, it, giving him getting him to go through Helsinki, uh, signing up for uh, Albert Schweitzer College which no one knew about. Nobody knew about Albert Schweitzer College except the Unitarian Church. Okay. We're going to end up getting to a lot of this. You yeah. just, we got to okay. stick on the All basic right. question here. But when it comes to, I mean, it's not that crazy to think that the government would find someone like Oswald, his profile, either use him or just stage something where he would take the blame. If you do believe that Oswald was a patsy, which I do believe, I do believe that there's some, I don't need to necessarily add in, let's try not to add in any MK Ultra stuff because that's too much to explain and however long we're doing this. But if we really examine using someone's profile or using a thing, not an agent provocateur, kind of a provocateur, but more like just kind of like a person that's going to end up taking the rap for everything. You have the profile of it. He fits a communist profile is what you're labeling him as. He went to Russia, right? Everyone's going to associate communism. He killed the president. It's a this type of thing. But then you get the cover up aspect. Well, then why didn't they just point at Russia and say Russia did it and go after them? Every well, other they, country was concerned that they, they were. They tried. Do it. They tried to. Do, that's what. That's what Mexico City was about. They tried to blame it on Russian Castro, and that's what Oswald was about. He was the link. Okay, Oswald killed Kennedy, and Oswald was in Mexico talking to Kostakov and to. Uh, the, the the Cuban embassy and meeting with people there. So therefore, Castro and the Russians did it. Bang, let's invade Cuba. You know, that was the, the original plan, phase one, you know. The Johnson uh Larry your silence is deafening me. <laughs> Johnson well, didn't want to get R- it. Robbie, you know that A, I'm a conservative conspiracy nut. Okay. We've established that. B, I already said I was contrarian and it had come to reject a lot of the classic conspiracy views that I even wrote about myself earlier. So you can probably see I'm off on a different tangent. But to, to get back to your point, I think one of the things we have to be cautious about is I've spent a lot of time studying how intelligence agencies actually work, not from JFK literature, but from their literature. And and the way they work is they it's it's kind of like sleepers. Gary made reference to sleepers earlier. Sleepers have got to be planted way early. You don't plant a su- sleeper that's associated with your source. They've got to be, that's sleeper. I, I don't see Russian wives as potential sleepers to Americans. That, that's just not the way intelligence works. But one of the reasons that I see Lee Oswald connecting to a lot of these dots is the the real, the best tool is somebody who's doing something on their own that is totally deniable because you don't have to tell them to do it. You simply determine that they're doing what you want, what you're interested in doing. And that's what I see about Oswald. I see Oswald pursuing his own worldviews, his own agendas, coming on, obviously coming onto the CIA's radar, no doubt about that, uh, in Angleton's files. As, as soon as he shows is he's going to Russia. As anybody can see, he's he's going to be in the files. So he's going to be on the radar. Uh, so I think that's where I differ, is I see Oswald acting on his own initiatives, but see, being observed by multiple agencies as a viable tool for their interest. They don't have to tell him what to do. That makes him perfectly deniable. And deniability is always the first caveat in these things. You, you giving people direct orders, you do that with spies. You know, they, they, those are assets. Those are real assets. And the best spies are always those people you recruit from the other side or that you're paying big money to. So I, I guess a, a long-winded response to you. One of the reasons I'm contrarian is a lot of my view comes from outside the JFK community and, and trying to map this to Things I didn't read in JFK books. So, okay. So uh, have, with that disclaimer, people can understand maybe where I'm coming from. <laughs> no, I value both of your perspectives, but how would you explain that if he didn't know anything or didn't know what was going on, he had to know a little bit because why would he go to just a movie theater after all oh. of this and have this weird flight pattern? Well, well my 
Okay. Anybody that's read my monograph or David Boylan's monograph and I on Redbird and the Wheaton leads, those yeah. sort of things, we certainly visualize Oswald as being involved with people that are in the conspiracy and that are manipulating him and maneuvering him. And he is doing he's doing two things. And my version of what he's doing on November 22nd is a he did make an effort to rebond with Marina as he had before. That didn't work out. She didn't immediately agree to go back and live with him. But there was a plan in place with him, with these other people relating to Cuba, relating to Redbird Airport. So there was something that he had in play. So there were other people. He knew something was happening. He had an idea of what was supposed to happen, which did not involve killing JFK. And so there is a conspiracy element in play. I mean, I can't even. So. Yeah, I I do think I do think there's more going on with Oswald that week, and I, I think a lot of it has to do with the conspiracy. It's he is being unwittingly maneuvered into being a patsy. I totally be, yeah t- totally agree that you put it very well. He was being manipulated, and you know what he thought was going on was not what was really going on, <laughs> and that's. That's the essence. But as far as the sleeper thing, that comes from an American document, from an intelligence document I have. They concluded that the Russians were had this program to send sleepers back. You know, uh, so I have it was it was not GFK. It was it was a C, it was an intelligence memo that said that. That's where it came from. You know, Gary. All I would argue about is I, I think even if they use the term sleeper, yeah, sending them back as assets. Okay. But- the real classic definition of a sleeper is somebody is not identified at all with, you know, the people they're working for. So I, I was arguing about the term. Yeah, yeah. OK. Well, that's how they put it in the in the document. That's why it's, you know, quote, uh, sleeper. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I totally agree. He was being manipulated. And what he thought was going on was not really he was being used and manipulated for a long time. And so how much. Well, how much evidence on Oswald is actual evidence that was linked to him or was him doing that? Like the typewriter incident where there was a note found or something that was written in Russian and, Ruth, you know, evidence that came out of Ruth Payne's house later, the rifle order. How much evidence is actually evidence Oswald was involved in these things or how much was that planted there to kind of create varying perspectives on who Oswald that, was? That depends. That depends on your worldview, Robbie. This is where we all start to come apart. It's sort of <laughs> if your worldview is that everything about Oswald is planted, or you know, everything has everything is done after the fact to make him look guilty, right? You know, everybody. The note was created after the fact, and so it's like if everything that's done to make him look guilty is done after the fact, then you can't trust anything. And that's one of the things I got to the point of it. There's a worldview that says we can't trust anything about Oswald because it was all planted after the fact to make him look guilty. Well, if that's really true, I might as well be over here playing with my train set because, you know, we're, nothing's going to happen. So my view actually is Oswald had learned to type. He'd taken a typing course. Some of his materials that he had done in 1960 thrive totally separately were typed. So I, I do, I've come to believe a lot of this we actually need to use as data because it tells us something. But Gary may just, and I totally understand why ever, ever people disagree because at one point in time, I disagree too. <laughs> Gary? Yeah, well, <laughs> I do believe a lot of the evidence was planted. And as for trusting people, are there any politicians that you trust Nowadays, I don't trust anybody. And Angleton certainly didn't trust anybody. So, yeah, I mean, Larry's right. Some of the stuff is authentic, probably. But there's too much evidence. There's too much of everything. There's two guns. There's two right. I mean, it, it, it just and they're the. The wallet is the big one. You know, why would you shoot a, a, a tip it and then drop your wallet there so they could have your identification? And then a second wallet shows up after they arrest him. The purpose of that was if Oswald escaped, there's his wallet. 
now we know who killed Tippett and who JFK, but he didn't escape. So now they're stuck with it with two wallets, you know, a copy and the and the. I mean, this stuff and the Dallas police were were, were so inept and so corrupt, and uh, they were all Ku Klux Klan and Birchers, and the, and uh, they were just uh, awful. And here they catch this crime of the century. They catch the guy in. 30 minutes or 60 minutes <laughs> and they have all this evidence and they're ready to hang them. I mean, it, it's not, it's not feasible. You know, it's just not. And time life persecuted him. I mean, if he'd have gone to jail, if he'd have gone to trial today, there's no way he'd have been, he'd, he was denied a lawyer. <laughs> they were, he was, he was, uh, he'd have had to get out of Dallas because uh, time life had, had gotten the American people to believe he was guilty the first day, you know, of, of these, I mean, it's just, too much evidence and too much one-sidedness uh, going on. The, the, they did get a see, lawyer and to I him, would but actually it was agree the... with you, on Gary, on that. I think my issue is with the timing. I think the point is that two things: a really good conspiracy. If if David Phillips or a real pro had put together a conspiracy, if we have instances where the CIA did frame people, okay. And they had all the assets in the world to create fake documents, great uh, transcripts, audio, camera, whatever, to set people up. If all of that had been put in place, you wouldn't have had all this nonsense after the fact. A lot of the stuff after the fact is literally sloppy. You know, it, it's sort of like, it's, it's stupid that, that you don't do this if you have a choice. You do it if you have it after the fact and you're you're trying to frame this guy who wasn't frameable. You know, that's why you do it after the fact. The media coverage, all that sort of stuff. I, I see it as overkill because the real story wasn't there to begin with. Well, I think the sloppy stuff was that Dallas police did. Oh, yeah. <laughs> not not CIA. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a sloppy with Dallas. Please. In, interesting, though, it's an interesting thing. Sherry Feaster, who I don't know if any of you knew directly. Sherry, we actually had Sherry go in and do a profile of the Dallas Police Department practices. I mean, she is a, a criminal expert. Uh, uh, she actually looked at their manuals and she looked at their performance, you know, what they took to court in the early 60s, what they didn't take to court. And they were sloppy. I mean, but their standards are not like what our standards are now. They they didn't really worry about chains of evidence. If if the DA took something into court, the judge believed it. The jury believed it. They They didn't have to worry about some of the things we have to worry about now. So they were constitutionally sloppy because that's the way their job was. And I, I think one of the things that we do not that I'm defending them on November 22nd, you understand. But one of the things we look at is we, we're very demanding in what you would expect to see in a courtroom now or what we in other courtrooms in the United States. We're, what they were doing and preparing for was what they were used to doing. The other problem they face, of course, is exactly how can you do a criminal investigation when the FBI collects 90% of your evidence and takes it away from you by midnight the first night, you know, what, what can you do? It's all gone. Sorry. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm working on this as hard as I can, but I got nothing. Um, yeah. Which, Robbie, I don't know that you, uh, other than establishing the fact that we have different views on this, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think a lot of it is artifacts. I guess that's where I come from. I think a lot of it is artifacts of having to frame Oswald after the fact, which the Warren Commission and the Johnson administration, everybody was very much into making him a lone nut versus artifacts of how how things came, how they happened, how the material was happened. For Lord's sake, we have the Secret Service get, being given primary evidence and none of the Secret Service agents appear to have had like five minutes of training in how to handle evidence. You know, you just don't hand it to the next person you see. You don't leave it on a stretcher, okay? You you know, you're supposed to prepare a written report of how you handle it. We don't have any of those. Wait, you don't so, believe Paul Landis? Paul Landis. Actually I, actually, I might believe Paul Landis at this point in time 
simply because actually what I think Landis is telling us is about multiple shooters. Uh, now, I, I don't believe Landis's book per se, but I and I believe Landis may be confused. But the fact that Landis may have found and picked up a whole bullet off the back seat of that car, I can't discount. Gary, what's your thoughts on Landis? Uh, I believe that he's. I believe that he found the bullet, and I believe that the bullet fell out of the back of Kennedy's back because it only went in this far. And they, I had always wondered about where did the throat wound go? Where did the bullet go? You know, did it go down? Is it in there somewhere? They never tra tra tracked it. They never tracked the back wound, but they did not line up. And the back wound, they put their finger in and it didn't go very far. So I always thought that, originally I thought that when they give, maybe gave Kennedy CPR or something at the hospital, it came out on the stretcher. But now we, you see that Landis, the thing that baffles me is how could he not give it to somebody or tell somebody he puts it on a table and it wasn't even the gurney. It was the table they were operating on, uh, Kennedy. And he leaves it there without telling anybody. And then certainly he's heard about the single bullet theory over the years. And he doesn't come forward and say it's wrong. <laughs> it's just it baffles me. But <laughs> It's I just, guess I would be more skeptical, Gary. I, I mean, we have Secret Service people who apparently took evidence at other places, like out of the limo in Washington, D.C. They say, well, we picked up stuff and we just sent it over to the we just had somebody carry it over to Bethesda. Like, no, no, though, you don't do that. Where, where is, Where's your note saying you who you turned it? So I'm, it's almost like Landis is no mm -hmm. better or no worse than any mm -hmm. of the other guys. <laughs> Well, any way you look at it, that proves that there was more than Oswald shooting. There was more than one gun because he found a two bullet, a bullet in, was it two bullets or, or a or bullet in two pieces on the seat? He found the one in the back of the limo behind the, uh, that fell out of his back. And then we have all the other bullets. So, I mean, it, there's no way that it, even if it isn't the single bullet, it, it's still too many bullets, no matter what. There's more than three. And, there's more than three shoot. More than one shooter. And in that regard, and just to show that I'm I'm still in the conspiracy camp. I know okay, you are. It's just like you know credentials. We also have the other bullet that was picked up on the south side of Elm Street, handed over most likely to some law enforcement. Wait, Buddy person. Walters? Uh, no, no. This this is the one that that that. The people saw the path, the track in the in the grass. They reported it to a police officer. We have photos of of the that strike, and we have photos of the guy putting the bullet into his pocket. Yeah, yeah it does go back. Buddy, to, that's, yeah, I'm that's sorry, Buddy yes, Walters. It, yeah, the Jim Murray took the photographs. Yeah, I, I think it, an interesting thing is that actually people in, interviewed locals, and I, I, I too tend to believe this. Who said, you know. I talked to an FBI agent who said, oh, yeah, it was it was common knowledge around the office that somebody had turned in a bullet. And they even they even talked about it. They actually used it in training classes locally in the office. And so they were all aware of it. So when they were asked, you know, where did it go? It's uh, that was a question we didn't ask. You know, that, that's just kind of the FBI was was very good at internally making sure questions were asked. I've just been reviewing some stuff that that on Oswald being a source, PSI, not an not an agent, any very specifically a source, where Hoover went to the extent of getting every agent to sign an affidavit that they did not recruit him as an informant. Now, legally, informant means something very specific in terms of the, the FBI. It, so I can sign that statement and be perfectly legally and morally correct when I could have talked to him about being a source of information and something totally different. And the one guy who wouldn't sign it, who actually left the FBI, um, was a fellow named CAC, who had been the one to actually write the report on Oswald's uh, uh, interview in New Orleans. Interestingly enough, we don't have his report. And he left the FBI. So, but I'm just, I said, there, there are good reasons to believe that internally, especially within the FBI, 
that a lot of things did get suppressed. I mean, we know they destroyed a note from Oswell. We know they took his notebook and retyped a page and reinserted it. So I just, I want to present some of this to kind of like be on record that it's not like I trust everybody. <laughs> no, I, I we all agree on conspiracy. I just think it's about finding what things we would say in our mind stand out as being conspiracy. I think the limo is a conspiracy thing for me, not in the sense that cleaning it out was just this big cover up thing, but the issue that there was bullets and brain matter that were put into a bucket and that bucket was never submitted into evidence. We don't know where any of those things that were picked out of that limousine went to that just disappeared to me that's an issue that's an ethical issue it's a whether that's covering the secret service reputation does not matter you can point it that's a clear-cut distinction another is the amount of times the agencies have lied about having a file on oswald and it's taken all this years later and documentation to come out that they just either destroyed a 201 file or they still have a file or every agency had a file another clear point that from the official story they lied and it shows you that they're covering something. We don't have to get into what that thing was, if it was MK Ultra, if it was this. We don't need that. What we need is the fact that here's a lie, and this is another lie, and this is another lie. So the Paul Landis thing, multiple shooters. Oh, okay, so that, that would lead into a different factor of the lone nut scenario. But there was obviously areas that were not investigated by the Warren Commission or any subsequent investigations later. And that is either shot from the knoll. They took some statements, but not enough and did not conduct a thorough investigation to prove who was that person flashing a badge on the knoll. Another conspiracy point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about the Harper fragment? I mean, th th there's the Warren Commission showing an intact head a photo of an ink hacker with a little bullet hole in it. And then the Harper Pat fragment is found and it's, it's a big piece of the back of the skull and nobody says anything about it. It's not in the Warren report or anything else. And that's definite proof <laughs> that he was, you know, that it was shot from the front, that, 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 that they're covering up. <laughs> I think it was, a, it's a fun fact. If we want to talk about fun facts that are suspicious, it's a fun fact that the Warren commission makes no mention anywhere that the FBI did a, a shooting scenario reconstruction, which is totally different from the Warren Commission's. Okay, all right. That's a problem. There's also one that I love best is they they send three CE-399 out to uh, a, a specialist panel review. At you know These are weapons experts. They do the, all the testing. These guys write a report that goes back to the commission that says, nope, sorry, you're wrong. In no way does this support the scenario that you're putting forth, that Mr. Spector is putting forth. That doesn't go into the report. It goes into the volumes, okay? Okay. But the only person on the ballistics committee who objects to that conclusion is Spector, who came up with the shooting scenario, right? So that all by itself, like when this one guy who made up the shooting scenario is the only one to object you got a pretty good clue that there, there's something wrong here. Yeah, and most all of the board commissioners didn't agree with the single bullet. They listened to Conley's talk, and they respected him as he was a hunter and knew guns. And especially Russell said, "There's no way that I won't believe John Conley over what Specter said." So, and they didn't want to sign the report because of the, of the single bullet there. So, uh, you're right. I mean, it's just. So much is neglected and overlooked and just pushed aside when it when it it shows conspiracy. They just push it aside and stick with this story that's so ridiculous. This, that single bullet theory is it's, that's the reason I think that this has gone on so long. No one believes that single bullet theory. And the only you know, other I, I would absolutely agree. Pat Spear in his on his website, he's done a, a beautiful job at evaluating some of the internal memos. And stuff that was merged about the Warren Commission, like uh, Liebler's. I mean, Liebler goes back and and writes this memo, like 20 page memo saying, here are things that people are going to pick apart in this report if we keep them in it. And they go, we don't want to hear. We, we've had enough memos. We need to publish this sucker. They ignore them. And, and sure enough, it's his list of 26 <laughs> that we picked apart for the last 50 years. That's it. You have to believe ridiculous stuff to, to accept it. And they're willing to do that. <laughs> they're willing to, to believe that. And, and, and Oswald's a track star. He can get down the stairs in 90 seconds. He can uh, he can do the mile, walk a mile in four minutes. I mean, this, this 
this is the stuff you have to believe to accept the Warren Commission's version of events. And but Oswald, I, I think your question about Oswald, Robbie, what makes it so difficult for us is I think we've just been talking about when everybody is motivated to run away from Oswald. The FBI is motivated to distance itself as much as possible. The CIA is eager to distance itself as much as possible. When everybody has reasons to run away and distance themselves from Oswald, clearly it's going to make it. And, and of course, the Johnson administration has every reason to support the lone nut thing. Let's get this over with. When everybody is running away from the real Oswald, it's it's real tough for us to find the real Oswald, you know, like no, nobody really wanted to see the real Oswald in my view. They, you know, they want the image that is, is going to be built to substantiate the report. So that's why it makes it so tough to see the real Oswald. Do you believe he took a shot of General Walker? I think it's possible. And uh, that, that would fall in. I don't necessarily believe that he intended to kill him, but Oswald was capable of dangerous actions, and I think we have to have to accept that. Oswald got into fistfights routinely. Oswald got into fistfights in the Marines. Oswald bought a gun in the Marines and shot himself. Uh, the Marine, some of the Marines, actually one of his NCOs thought he had done that to get out of the service early uh, and get a, a discharge. He, he did a lot of stuff in the Marines that I mean, really hurt himself. So he could do stupid things at times. Um, and I, I've revisited that. I think I think there's I think there's a strong case that he certainly was he had, had observed and had Walker under surveillance. There's a a strong case that he was interested in Walker. You will find people associated with Walker names and addresses in Oswald's notebook. Oswald was very fascinated in the ultra right. Yeah, I think there's a case that can be made for that. I know that I know that's con controversial too, but um, I, I I don't put it out of it's not totally out of character for Oswald, and it's not totally out of character for Oswald to to spend a lot of time planning that. And one of the things actually it speaks to me against Oswald being a presidential assassin, if you did accept the fact that he had put Walker under surveillance, that he'd prepared notes and a plan and even left something for Marina that's totally out of, it's totally inconsistent of what he did on November 22nd. So in some cases I find Oswald's, it's, it's, it's sort of like if we accepted that and that's Oswald's normal behavior, why don't we see it on November 22nd? Because that's not what he did on November 22nd. Yeah, uh, right-wing general versus shooting JFK with a largely different political view would take out the political motivations the Warren Commission also painted. But also, there were, not mistaken, someone that witnessed two people at the scene of the Walker shooting. So that would also be a problem if you really, like I said, everything that we talk about, even if uh, us three, we disagree on certain points, everything kind of rebuts the Warren Commission's prime examples that he was a lone nut if he's with two people or that he was this person that hated Kennedy when even Marina stated that she said that I think Oswald admired Kennedy and everything that she knew about JFK was from Oswald. That's in her Warren Commission testimony. And also if you have him, if you try to have him, again, it's sort of like sometimes we give away the good stuff. If he's such a terrible shot that he can take a rifle and sit there at night and miss Walker at close range in a lighted window, now why should I expect that he managed to hit the president three times over six seconds? You know, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it would make sense that he could would shoot Walker because he's right wing, uh, you know, but Kennedy – that doesn't make any sense. It's is that why would somebody sh go after right wing and left wingers? What are you what are you going trying to accomplish? You know, but the the thing is, there's a lot of problems with the Walker shooting. Uh, the bullet was, I believe, it was originally, although it was badly damaged, was supposed to be a thirty odd six, which Oswald didn't have. Uh, they actually were had a, a suspect, a guy that used to work for Oz or for Walker, and that was pretty. You know, and, and then the fact that, uh, he, again, the, the guy saw two people in, in a car and, and Oswald didn't drive and so forth. 
but also that the reports that it was Oswald, I think, showed up in Germany uh, first in, in a newspaper that Walker was somehow affiliated with, a fascist newspaper, a Nazi newspaper. And so it looked like, uh, like it was a, a, a publicity stunt done by Walker to get attention, you know, to get promoted to uh, political ambitions or whatever. So I don't think, I think it, it, it would make more sense for Oswald to have shot Walker, but I don't think he did it. And and Marina's ridiculous story of burying the rifle and taking a bus with a rifle. I mean, it, it, he's the only guy, the only assassin in history that takes cabs and buses and walks. Well, he's the only and, guy who takes <laughs> four bullets to assassinate well, the president. I would have to, I would have to disagree with you on, on that one point because Stu Wexler and I have always been fascinated that James Earl Ray escaped on a bus after shooting Martin Luther King. It's sort of like, how do you get away? How do you get out of the car? Oh, well, I'll take a bus. Okay, well, he, took, fine. He, had a, he had a Mustang. Well, but he left the country after he got to Atlanta and ditched the bay. He, he, he escaped via bus. You know, not a good plan, but... Uh, but we can look but, at Marina's testimony of Oswald with the rifle and be able to point out that the Warren Commission's version is completely untrue. She didn't know what she was talking about. I think the HSCA kind of revealed that later when they said that she didn't know the difference between a rifle and a shotgun. And this story about shooting leaves in the backyard is just obviously yeah. magic fantasy. Well, well, one of the things, and, and I probably don't think we have even enough time to get into I I, I put much more credit in Marina's statements at different times. I bro View Marina is a very situational source. There are times when she's telling the truth. There's times when she isn't. Early on, she is not. And one of the reasons she's not is that she is trying to cover for Oswald. Uh, she's actually trying to cover for Oswald. She destroyed a copy of the photo at home, admittedly. Uh, she care. She actually had a copy. She probably destroyed two copies of the photo, which is an interesting thing. But early on in her testimony... Yeah, it's one thing. Later on, there, there are two. It's very situational. You have to look at what she's saying. Quite frankly, early on, she has to. I'm not concerned that she's so worried about being deported, although I'm sure in the first 48 hours, 72 hours, maybe. But there's also a question of her being considered an accessory. You know, how much did you know about this? Oh, you, you know, he had a rifle. You knew what what. How much? Yeah. You know, so there are concerns, legitimate concerns on her part, and she does lie. I, it and you, I wrestle with the fact about when she is and when she does, and I've reached my own views, which other people won't agree with. I understand, uh, but pretty much we're all doing this for ourselves. So I, I think that I think considering the bond that they, the two of them had, if Oswald did go to do something to Walker. I think he would have left her letter and 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 told her you know, do this, do that, go to the Red Cross if nothing else. And the fact that he doesn't do that on November twenty second is yet more evidence that that's not what he was about on November twenty second. So Gary, I totally actually, I in the last six months I've reexamined all this Walker stuff, been all over the the map on it because I was where you were. I, I mean, this is not where. I was. I talked with Gail Nix Jackson at length. We did a conference presentation together in Dallas. So I, I'm familiar with all the issues and I'm with you. You know, that's why I say I don't consider it out of the realm of possibility, you know, but certainly can't prove it. Although the, I, I do think the photos of the Walker residents are legitimate and that Walker was, and that Oswald was there. And it, interestingly enough, we, we when we started early, one of the first things when Oswald talked to American reporters inside Russia after he'd gone to the embassy, his condemnation of the U.S., things that he didn't like, the reason he wanted to, the first thing he started talking about was American racism and the oppression of the American. Black. So he was very much, I, I think, opposed to the ultra right. And to him, the ultra right could be Walker. And the Birch Society and the, those the addresses that were in his notebook, or it could be the anti-Castro Cubans, which he considered ultra right. Uh, in any event, so. 
What would you guys consider to be one flaw the Warren Commission had about Oswald that you would point out to anyone who was new to the assassination that he was not the shooter of JFK? There's a lot. <laughs> I just need one. <laughs> Well, Let me process I, that, Robbie. Let's see. Let's start scanning through the deck here. Try yeah, not to yeah. pick one we had talked about earlier. That'd be nice. Try a new example. Well, one thing would be the Larry. What Larry mentioned, what the the shooting test that they did to prove that Oswald shot uh, Kennedy. They they had them at half the height. You know, no tree in the way. Take as long as you want for the first shot. Stationary target. Uh, I mean, and then they couldn't do it. <laughs> They 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 only had they didn't have near as well a performance as Oswald did. So and then they said, well, therefore, it uh, it proved that it, that that he did it, you know, because because one of them hit the they only had to hit the upper half of the body, not the head. You know, they only had to do this and they they couldn't do it even under those conditions. Oswald's shooting at a moving target uh, with a tree in the way and he only has. A split second to, and then he has to re-aim they were allowed to, to to overcome all the obstacles and they still couldn't do it so i mean to me that's it that I, I would reinforce that point there was actually a guy named willens who was the justice department liaison with the commission who wrote a memo about um, oh i think he wrote it in august something like that when the report was in draft and pretty well finalized saying you guys need to take out this whole chapter on Oswald as a marksman shooting the president because we have nothing to support that he's a good enough marksman to do that. If you even bring this up, you will expose us to criticism. Liebler followed up and they're, they're going, you guys don't have a case here. You really don't. You don't have when when Oswald went through basic training, he qualified as a marksman. OK. By the time he got to AIT, advanced infantry training, he barely qualified. This is back to Oswald. You know, he, he changes. You know, he wasn't interested anymore. I got in. I'm good. I got through basic. Who cares? Um, well, do you believe multiple it, people were using his name? Okay, another question. Okay. See, Gary, he sent us off on another question already. Go ahead. Okay. You got it. <laughs> I just, I do I believe do. that. I just I don't, do. I don't know how many. I don't believe it was like 30 something occurrences like Paul Blue mentioned, but I believe that there was a couple instances you could point out where like Oswald didn't drive, but he was trying to sell his rifle for a car. I don't know about that whole scenario. I don't know about the shooting range of shooting another target um, and saying, so I'm going to do to JFK. Those are where I'm a little bit iffy on. Um, There's a new book out coming out at. I, I just I'm about a third of the way through it. It's excellent. It's on June Cobb and Jerry Cobb, uh, who were uh, June Cobb was a CIA agent. She was stationed in Mexico when uh, Oswald was there and she had been uh, in uh, Cuba. She was working for Castro. She was one of his sec. She was a translator and, and, and she's deeply CIA. But what the author the author befriended a woman named jerry cobb now jerry cobb and june cobb were born in the same town they grew up in the same places they both traveled to south america to work with indigenous indians their story is parallel they're both they both were pilots and jerry cobb became the first woman to pass the astronaut flying tests back when before john glenn <laughs> And she was a world famous pilot. And it turns out that so she became friends with his Jerry Cobb and she started to suspect that they were the same person or sisters or some way. So that their lives were so parallel that she like Webster's and Oswald in that in 59 and 60, that she thought that they were either uh twins or, or 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 somehow tied together and and jerry cobbs told her she never met june cobb in 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 they grew up in the same town a small town and they were both flyers and they were both in the civil air patrol together <laughs> and she says she didn't know her but she says i've heard of her and she sometimes impersonates me so here's what's going on with and she uh, the woman goes into this um uh, idea of using people's names and 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 following the same trails and that, that it was an intelligence uh 
it was to muddy the water and so forth. And it, she really explains it very well. So that book could, could answer your question as far as uh, sometimes they may have used each other's names like Sueta and Mertz did. Uh, Mertz used Sueta's name, Sueta used Mertz's name. Sometimes they were in the same place doing the same things. Sometimes they were got press that was similar. So this this was a technique that was being used. And so it's very likely that Oswald, and, and then as Bill Simpich, you know, it, 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 it believes, they were trying to confuse the Russians with Webster and Oswald. So they gave them the same height, the same weight, you know, the same to, to confuse and that's what they do with these people. And I think with Oswald, that was definitely going on. Either there was someone impersonating him or they were using his name or whether they look like him or not, whether they were using his name. And that is a standard intelligence ploy. Well, Mexico then. City is a clear example because you have a memo from Hoover saying that wasn't Oswald that was caught taking photos at the embassy or caught in photos. I, I think what I would pitch in on two comments really, the the first is I'm for, very familiar with the book that Gary has written or, or is talking about. And I, being from Oklahoma, I can tell you the people from their hometown think it's kind of humorous because they're in the same high school class. Everybody knows these two. Uh, and they don't quite go with that. But when, but when you get to the end of the book, what's interesting, of course, is at the end of the book, this lady is the person who shoots JFK oh. from the, from, yeah, Ooh. get to the, she oh, ends I, up being, You just ruined the book for me. Well, I'm sorry. That's why some of us have a couple of problems. The, the, the first part, everybody's kind of like, this is really interesting. And then when we get to the end and she flies to Dallas and is the babushka lady and shoots JFK, it kind of, anyway, but. Well, well that really ruined it. That ruined it. Damn, spoiled it, Larry. <laughs> I'll wait till you get there. But, you know, it, it kind of I'm takes a, it downhill. At, anyway. I'm, a, I'm only halfway through, so. But yeah, and I think that it's funny looking at some of the comments. Everything's been just where you were until they get about halfway through the book, and then it's like, "Wait a minute, reset." Uh, but I, I, certainly, I think one of the things we have to, I think we can agree on. I, I, I certainly, I certainly see that there's strong evidence of Lee Harvey Oswald's name being used when it's not Lee Harvey Oswald, and you know, it's it's being used for play for intelligence purposes. The CIA is using that. In some cases, it's being used. One of the things we, I think, Robbie, we've talked about it, but it, it doesn't get much focus, is as early as August in Miami, we have the DRE writing Congress people about Lee Harvey Oswald as a threat. We have the DRE circulating warning memos to all the anti-Castro exile groups of e. Har Lee Harvey Wall Oswald is a threat. Certainly the CIA, you know, they know this is there. There's a propaganda campaign that starts around Lee Harvey Oswald's name and image. Okay. But in other places, yeah, I do think in Dallas, the, the car incident, the car purchase incident was a literal flat out impersonation. Uh, one of the things, uh, it's easy to impersonate Oswald to some extent because he doesn't look that much different from your average male of that age, size, stature, hair color remarks. It's it's not that one of the interesting things that's being discussed right now, and somebody put up a picture, is that Gary may have heard of this incident in Dallas where a policeman working at a, a car repair place saw somebody drive up and 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 they think that's Oswald and it's been discussed and somebody's he, he wrote down the license plate of the guy who's, of the car okay as it turns out if you take the picture of that guy in high school and age it you know computer wise and set it beside Lee Oswald you would go yeah that's Lee Oswald and so it is easy to Identify. I, I think the other place that jumps out at me, though, in addition to the car in, purchase incident, where his remarks are important because he brings Russia into it and taking money, just like David Phillips has him taking money. That that's that's a good one. But downtown, at two or three places, uh, a person using the Oswald name and representing himself as Oswald, was looking for a job at places on Main Street. 
And one of those places, he actually signed a piece of paper. He wrote down it, and, and the guy who took the application, his boss, both knew about it. And when you look at the FBI report and see the kind of hoops that they had to jump through to say, oh, that wasn't really Lee Oswald, then you go wondering, well, was Lee Oswald just looking at a job at a place on Main Street when he had already had a job? Was that really Lee Oswald? What are they covering up? Is Are they covering up the fact that it was really Lee Oswald or if there was somebody impersonating Lee Oswald? You know, no wonder we get wrapped up in our socks. What's one area for both of you guys that you would like to know more about Oswald? Doesn't have to be anything about the whole actual, like, did he pull the trigger? Or did he not pull the trigger? You don't need a definitive answer like that. But one area of research or one area about his life you would like to know more about that we might not have documentation on or you guys haven't maybe gotten to. Yeah, uh, Mexico City. I would like to certainly know more about that. That's an area that the CIA is, not, is really holding back on. And I don't know if they're covering up another operation that was involved that, uh, you know, was piggybacked somehow. But uh, that is, and Joe and Edis, those two. I don't think there's that much, other than being able to talk to Oswald in person. I don't know. But I mean, I don't know that that much is about his life because we have his writing. We we have what books he read. You know, I know what books he was checking out and reading. I know who he admired and who he didn't admire. I, I so I know a lot about him. What I don't know is is what Gary just is what was going on around him. Uh, the Joannidis documents would be critical. Um, if if I wanted to, I I'm not so much concerned about Oswald. I'd like to know what David Phillips really knew about Oswald. And what he thought he was doing with it, he was certainly. So, Rob, it's hard, hard to. It's not so much Oswald that's a mystery to me. Any, I won't say it. Obviously, he's a mystery to me. But it's these other people that are bigger mysteries. You know, that's Oswald's what I, that's my next question gets to was going to be. Clear. My next question was going to be about who do you think should get more scrutiny when it comes to investigative or research? Anybody else? It doesn't need to be Oswald. But I would look at Michael Payne. A hell of a lot more because I don't think he was really asked the full blunt of questions in his testimony, and I th feel like he knows a little bit more than he lets on. Um, there's just a certain couple things I c consider suspicious. Michael Payne and his friends. I mean, we know there are FBI reports that that interview friends of Payne. I, again, there's a lot of information because we tend to avoid the FBI. I think we. I don't know that anybody has dug nearly enough into the FBI reports and what's there there are fbi reports that say you know did you ever talk to anybody about oswald oh yeah i talked to a couple of my buddies then they go interview his, his buddies okay you know what did he say where were you on november 22nd well, we were in dealey plaza uh you know that there's a lot of data there that the fbi collected that is meaningless nobody ever really looked at it because that's not what they were looking for that we could use Michael Payne is one. Um, in, in terms of, I, okay, the question is really who we would like to look at that hasn't been looked at. Is that right, Robbie? Or anyone or, you feel like should be maybe given a second glance at if you could do another investigation. And these people oh, were alive, Lord. of course. Yes. If, I'll give you a whole other investigation. Um, I would look, I would go to New Orleans and I would look, I would really deal with Oris Pena's testimony and investigate it. And the interesting thing is that's what Garrison did. Garrison took that very seriously and said, the key to this whole thing is who Oswald was talking to when he was not home with a pregnant wife. You know, who... Who was who was he to borrow? Was that Oswald or was it not Oswald? If it was Oswald, so I would take Pena as a lead, and that's what Garrison did. And that the first place he Garrison sent his investigators was Miami to look for those Cubans, because Pena told them those Cubans were from out of town. None of us knew them. You know, find those Cubans and see who was associating with Lee Oswald in New Orleans. And I think he would get right to the core of the matter. And what frustrated Garrison is 
when he sent his investigators to Miami. And again, this is people really don't look at these reports, but when he sent his investigators to Miami, the first thing they went did was go to the police. I mean, these are kind of like private investigators. So they go to the law enforcement and go, well, who who could really help us? You know, I got a picture of this guy, or I've got a description of this guy. Who could help us find them? And the guys go, well, there's this great PI agency in town. It's run by the DeTorres family. Guy's been here for 25 years. Brother's here now. Go talk to him. They know all the Cubans. Those they send into DeTorres, who I consider to have been running cover for the real guys in Miami. And the first thing that DeTorres does is volunteer to garrison to help him and then blows him out of the water to the press. So I, I would start with Pinion. If the if somebody had really with federal resources, like a real FBI investigation had started with Pena, with the leverage they had and nobody gave Garrison, I think you would get you could get some traction. Yeah, yeah um, the pain. That's that's very. The pain documents are still sealed, aren't they? Um, not the interviews with Michael, the FBI. Um, no, I'm talking about Pena. Oh, Pena. Um, there are there are some that are still st- sealed. There are some that appear to have disappeared. I mean, I you can't really say that they're sealed. Because Pena describes making reports like a lot of the reports that should be in the FBI office files and that they just aren't there. So it's like, I don't know that they're sealed. My personal opinion is they were destroyed. He's the one that saw Oswald with uh, De Bruys and uh, the yeah. uh, the uh, Immigration Service. He, and... uh, customs. He's, he's yeah, custom, customs. Run customs. That was Joan Mellon wrote a lot about that. Well, and Sempich has done a lot of that. One of the things we need to remember is that's where Oswald had worked when he was a teenager. He had worked for freight forwarders and other people down at, he was very into customs. And I, I and he, when he went overseas, remember, he said, what, what's your job? I work in, uh, I forget what it was. Yeah, import, export. So uh, TJ, he worked for TJ. Was that his name? I don't know how to pronounce it, but. But, but yeah, yeah. Um, I think the real key, key there is Pena had seen him, seen ever had, and since Pena actually was a source for De Beers as well, he was in a perfect position to say, "You guys need to go look at De Beers. If anybody knows what's going on with Oswald, um, he does. <laughs> he does." And I'm writing a lot about this at the moment, and and that's I think that was true. That's why I would start with there and and. You know, if anybody who really might have been knowing who he was talking with and meeting with, the FBI might, there's there's this gap that really tr- is troublesome. There's this gap between when, uh, of several weeks, where the FBI knows all about Oswald. He's actually volunteered to provide them information, and nobody's doing anything. It, he's... We we know we don't we don't even we don't have that report. We don't have the report from the guy that interviewed Oswald. Uh, what we have is something from the FBI's 201 file, which says it contains that report and has a signature, but it's not the office file. We don't have CAC's office. We have no office files from New Orleans that tells us you know what's really going on there and. I have every reason to believe that anything that's pulled up into the FBI's 201 file that we can still see is what they're okay with us seeing. You know, so De Bures, it's interesting. If I was going with him, De Bures would be, I think, the guy who could really tell us something out of New Orleans. Uh, I, I agree, Gary, but he's clearly not going to. And by the way, he signed that affidavit saying he wouldn't. <laughs> I guess and they, I, justice gave him executive privilege. When Garris got, Garrison got a subpoena issued to this guy, who's the office supervisor. He's not just an agent. He's the office supervisor. And FBI practice says, by the way, at the time, and uh, the church committee found this out, is that you could be evaluating somebody as a source, as, as a PSI, okay? And you don't have to have your interview forms, your contact forms, until you actually officially make him a source 
You can talk to them all you want. And all you got to do is put one piece of paper in a 201 file, office file, and tell the head of the office what you're doing. That's De Beers, okay? So when Garrison tries to get to him, uh, we actually have the memos that say from justice that justice gave him the right to invoke a executive privilege, classified information, national security level information in his interviews and told him he could only answer two questions, which were not any of the questions we would want to ask. I guess I ask you guys just one last question. You guys give me enough of your time. I appreciate you guys doing this. I, I told you, I was like, we we unite on conspiracy. We all believe conspiracy. I wanted to get you guys together because I respect both you guys through the independent conversations we've had, and we've done one together. Um, and I thought it went well. I want to ask you guys one last question, which is if you were going to recommend to someone out there to where they should start looking when it comes to Oswald to understanding who he is. You guys don't have to agree on where you guys would look, but I would just, from your own research, anyone that listened to this that might agree with either you, Larry, or agree with you, Gary, they might want to know more. I'm interested in the MK Ultra stuff. So, you know, people like to go across that kind of stuff if that's what they want to believe. Larry, you want to go first and then go on I would Gary. definitely, in terms of character, I would read the tit of its book. And I would also, um, DeMorne Shield wrote a, a monograph, if you will, I am a Patsy, that gives his personal dialogues with Oswald. I would refer to that. And then for my own views, I think probably within six months, I will have my 150 page Oswald monograph paper out and you can read that. And then you're going to have my jaundiced opinions. <laughs> Gary? I, I kind of agree with Larry. Uh, the Titovitz book is very good. And George DeMoren Schilt gives you a real insight because he was very close to him in Dallas. And I uh, as as uh, against conspiracy and everything as it is, the Frontline uh, documentary on Oswald, did you ever see it, is very good. It's very excellent uh, as to explaining his background and everything that was going on. It's more from the Warren Commission perspective, and Richard Helms gets on it and lies like a rug. Uh, I mean, uh, about this uh, the debriefing that Oswald went through. A guy named Anderson supposedly debriefed Oswald. They found papers with his signature, and uh, Helms looks at it and said, "Oh, I don't know what that is. I've never seen anything like that." That's a, and you know he's lying. <laughs> so, but those probably are the three best sources. I would I would give one other source. I think within the tit of its book, if you. He has a great photo montage in the book of Oswald in Russia. And then Groden, in, in his, one of his books about Oswald, has a great collection of Oswald photos. And if those photos had been in the press, uh, Oswald in school, clowning around, joking around, joking with girls at water fountains, hugging people in Russia, if that had been available to the media, they would not have been able to, to sell this radical, antisocial, image that they were able to sell and, and so that's really important i think for seeing oswald in pictures seeing him clowning around in the marines like oswald loved taking pictures he's not bashful there's there's a picture of him in in the philippines and in the doorway and the background is john wayne i mean you gotta love that uh because he's visiting the troops but look at the pictures of oswald and see what you think of oswald then yeah well, I'm gonna I link agree. That's that good one. That's uh, Roden's book is good. I'm going to link all those in the description. I'm also going to link your guys' links to your separate sites that we use for past episodes. Uh, and I do appreciate, like I said, the time for giving me uh, to talk about Oswald and talk about JFK assassination and just giving people, you know, we're trying to find some common ground on some things. Obviously, we disagree on some stuff, but I think we all agree conspiracy. And there's a lot of things we do agree on, which I think is important. Um, but thank you again, everybody, for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank. Stay tuned for next